Suzanne Stefanik, and I'm your host today for Transmedia Day. My great pleasure and honor. Um, the room's filling up, uh, which is great. Um, but meanwhile, um, there are legions watching right now uh, online. <laughs> I would um, feel free to use Twitter at will. Uh, you, could t you could tweet that, in fact, the live stream's happening. The address is right up here. It's at uvu.com slash digital Hollywood. Uh, if you would like to uh, tweet specifically about what's going on here, you can use the hashtag here. So today, uh, we're looking at transmedia. It's still a word that raises eyebrows here and there. <laughs> but um, it defines a very real new genre. And um, storytelling has become very complex. And um, there are those who are really moving forward with it and starting to make a difference. They're starting to really drive stakes into the ground and do things that actually help to define what will be the new storytelling as we move forward across all these platforms and with engagement and all of the issues that that raises. And there are a few companies that are uh, making great strides. And among them is Fourth Wall. Um, this entire table is filled with the Fourth Wall Brain Trust. Um, they're fabulous. They just won um, an interactive media um, Emmy uh, only a few weeks ago. Congratulations once again. Um, so I think um, they're going to show us a few things no one's ever seen, well, no one but them has <laughs> seen before, <laughs> along with some older things. And I think that you'll find um, this a wonderful case study in uh, what's happening out there, and when you take this to a very professional level, what we have today and what we can look forward to tomorrow. So I'm going to hand this off to Jim. Great. Jim Stewart. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Really appreciate you having us here, and uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. I, I know it's on the early side. Um, so we're really excited to be here, and the first thing I want to do is just introduce you to my partners in crime here, uh, starting with Alan Lee, who's our chief creative officer. Alan has a, a very long background being a pioneer in various interactive formats, including being the lead game designer for the original Xbox, which included Halo, etc. He and our third partner, Sean Stewart, um, more or less invented this genre some of you may have heard of called alternate reality games uh, and is just generally a really smart guy. Uh, <laughs> over, over there, in no particular order, we have uh, Jackie Turner. She's our head of production. Hi. Uh, Jackie is actually a two-time Emmy Award winner um, and uh, is just one of the most experienced, innovative execs uh, in the business. Uh, we're really lucky to have her. Uh, Steve Peters, to my left here, is Vice President of Experience Design. And you might ask, what the hell is Vice President of Experience Design mean? Uh, the basic idea is that what we're doing is bringing together a whole lot of different kinds of entertainment. So uh, in, our, in our shows and what we create, we have game design, we have narrative, uh, we have traditional filmmaking, we have lots and lots of different kinds of, of content that come together to form a single experience. And Steve is the one who figures out how that all actually works. Um, so, you know, thank God for Steve. Um, and over here we have Benham Carbasi, who is our Vice President of Production and is general, gen, generally the unstoppable engine at the heart of our company. He makes stuff happen and uh, knows just about everything there is to know about the business that we're in. Um, so in keeping with the name of our company, uh, that is Fourth Wall and the breaking thereof, uh, we're going to try and make things a little bit interactive. We're not going to play musical chairs or anything, but uh, we, will, we will at least try to mix things up a little bit. So the, the first thing I want to do is basically play a little game, and, and it's a really simple game. And the game is, what am I? That's, that's all there is to it. So just as I'm talking, you know, think about, what am I? So, I'm a technology. I've been around for 30, 40 years, really. Um, a little over 15 years ago, uh, I became really popularized. Um, it, it was, at the time, very obvious that I was a transformative um, technology, um, that not only was I, were there applications in entertainment, but for news and information to be basically 
shared much more quickly and much more globally um, across the planet. Um, and it's obvious that it was going to cause a major disruption across numerous industries. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing to, to know about me is that it's been really hard to figure out kind of what are the distribution um, channels for, for this new platform. Um, you know, what, um, how am I going to be monetized, et cetera. <clears throat> and, and so that's just been a, a big function of, of, of uh, the way that people perceive me. And at the same time, how do you make content for this technology? What, what does it mean to uh, develop content in this way? And part of what um, people have tried to do is take the old kinds of con content and put them on me to try and display them on this new technology. Um, so that's it. What am I? Uh, that's true. Uh, that's not the only answer. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> All right. Well, I'll, I'll call that correct, too. Um, no, the answer is the movie camera. So if, if you go back literally exactly 100 years to 1912, everything I said was true about the movie camera at that point. Um, the, it was just as transformative. All of the same patterns um, were, were manifest. Uh, they, all of the business models had to change. All of the distribution had to change. And most pertinent, I think, to this conversation, the ways of actually creating the content had to drastically change, right? Because what they ended up doing is kind of what the internet does now, which is they took a movie camera and they went to a stage play because that was the dominant form of entertainment and they filmed stage plays, right? And then they distributed that across the country and hoped that that was gonna be awesome for everybody. But the reality is that there are trade-offs in stage plays that are in, in, endemic to the property itself, to the, to the format itself. And so they had to start figuring out, okay, what, is, what are the special things about the movie camera that will allow me to tell stories differently? The cut, changing different locations, parallel action. There was a big um, scare sort of back in the day that if you had more than one thing happening at a time, that you were gonna literally drive people insane. <laughs> like, how can you possibly keep two things in your head at once? So everybody was worried that there was going to be this global pandemic, you know, of psychosis brought on by, by movies. And you'll hear a lot of the same kind of themes uh, on the Internet. Oh, it's attention deficit disorder theater, right? And the truth is that's just bullshit. What it is is attention enhancement, right? We've become now now able to... Uh, to consume three, four, and more different streams of, of information at the same time. And so our challenge has been, how do you create entertainment that fits that paradigm? And so we're going to tell you a little bit more about kind of the, the ways that we do that um, as we move forward in the presentation. Uh, by the way, in 1912, um, uh, what happened over the ensuing six, 36 months is Paramount and Warner Brothers and MGM and Universal and Fox. That's what happened in, in the next three years. So is that going to happen this time? I don't know. Um, but the pattern is certainly there. So um, I'm going to pass it on now to my friend, Alan Lee. All right. Um, so we're, you guys are starting to get this idea of where we come from, of this idea that the world of entertainment is changing. And, and we know all kinds of statistics, right? The next, the next important point is now we're going to splash a whole bunch of numbers up on the screen to prove this point, to prove that audiences are migrating away from television, to prove that the internet is king, to prove that uh, there's all kinds of new content and opportunities out there. And, and as we thought about that, we thought, man, you guys have probably seen all these numbers before, right? <laughs> so. Right. So, so we thought what, what might be a little bit more interesting is, what if we tried to recreate those statistics in this room right now? Let's see if these things are accurate. Let's see if entertainment is actually changing. Okay, so here's where we're going to start. Uh, we're going to ask you guys just three simple questions, um, and we're going to see what, how, how this turns out. First question. Okay. How many people watch TV shows on a TV? 
got about so now think regular yeah big screen TV all right um, we're at I don't know what do you guys think 980 90 percent 95 somewhere in there okay okay so uh, we're gonna do something crazy and see if we can get that to update in real time maybe right. Venom's gonna work his magic what was our percentage here we're we gonna go 90 fair 90 percent Ah, real time. There we go. Okay. okay. Whoa. Now, here's the crazy part. Um, I want you guys to put yourselves in the sort of way back machine of three years ago. Um, and uh, for, to, to help with that reference, today, uh, today we've got things uh, like this, right? Uh, now, the way back machine, think three years ago. Right. We go from Gangnam Style, you guys all remember, to the meat dress. There that we go. That was just three so, years so ago. So this is to help you with your, your mental reference here. Okay, same question. Watch TV on a TV. And the way back machine. All right. Okay. So uh, in this room, it, it seems like a, about, I would say again, 90, 95% somewhere in there. All right, okay. so uh, you guys aren't helping with our statistics at all. So <laughs> instead, what we're going to do is show you the actual statistics. <laughs> right, uh, it's a good point. By, by age actually matters a lot here. Um, but uh, these are TV ratings today, um, and uh, up rather tracked up to today. And there's a lot of contributing factors to this. Obviously, the audiences are spreading out across a vast number of more channels. They're moving to the internet. Um, but these trends, again, these are numbers you guys have all seen before. Um, it's, starting to, it's starting to really show that there is this trend away from television, uh, except for in this room, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's down. That's very down. All right, next one. You want to you wanna handle this? Sure. So um, let's see. How many people use another device while watching TV today? today? Right. Okay. <laughs> Um, um, help me out, guys. Is. Look around. 85. Oh, whoa. Hey. hey, hey okay. Hey, hey, hey. We just jumped Using from like device. 80 to 90. That's a lot of people. That's All a lot right. of 90%. All right. This year. All right. Okay. Uh, same deal. Visual aids to help you understand what three years ago means. Okay. So today we have Honey Boo Boo. You guys, you guys all know Honey Boo Boo Child, I, I believe, is the correct. Um, and what did we do three years ago that was so amazing? What did we think of a, a poor child? Oh, yeah, it's Bubble Boy. <laughs> we all remember him. That was three, merely three years ago. So let's see um, how many people Same use question. another device. While you're watching TV, smart device in your hand three years ago. Right, okay. Yeah, that's a little yeah, better. There we that's go. a little better. Look at that guy. <laughs> He's cheating our numbers. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, what was that, 10%? Hands up again. Let's just look around here. Yeah. yeah. 20. 15. 15. 15 it is. Okay. Okay, now you guys are actually matching the stats that. we were looking for. Uh, so here's how the actual nation uh, ranks with that. 86% um, today use a smart device uh, while watching television. Um, and we've got the breakdown of as far as days, weeks, and months, but uh, the point is this room is pretty accurate to, to this dramatic trend uh, that, that we're all seeing. And uh, what we'll get to uh, with the rest of our speakers here on this panel is that we all should be taking advantage of immediately. Okay. Are we ready for question three? Yeah, do it. Okay. So how many people left their homes to watch a, uh, to watch a movie today? You go out, you go see a movie, you get some popcorn. Let's see. Yeah, okay. What do we got? Se 70? 75? 70. 70. 70? 75? Somewhere in there? Okay. Okay. That's 70. Okay, visual aids. Here we go. Uh, today, Kanye West making, making poor life decisions. Yeah. <laughs> and we remember three years ago, Kanye West making poor life decisions. <laughs> yeah, once again. So let's take a poll. Same question. Left your house to see a movie. Yeah, of course. This was a, this was a slow ball. All right. There, there's... <laughs> we'll call it 80. Really? All right. I was, it's closer to 95. All right. 95 it is. You're, using word to word only. You're right. No, that's... Yeah, no, it's a really valid point. It's, it, it is all in the phraseology uh, of the actual question. Um, but what we really want to get to is the actual stat. I mean, we all know where this is going, but just to show you guys the actual numbers, um, 
the box office revenue is just taking a dive, and we all know this. And uh, we're watching audience. It's not that entertainment's boring. It's not that people don't want to uh, experience good stories, don't want to be entertained. Of course, they're just finding other ways to do it. Now, all of that said, uh, I'm sorry. That, that is a different issue. <laughs> um, all of that said, what we really want to talk to you guys about today, now that we, I hope, can all agree on this, this exodus that we're all witnessing, um, what we want to talk to you guys about is some alternatives. And what we're doing as a studio and the tremendous reception and the tremendous success we've had in looking at these numbers and instead of just worrying about where the future might take us, actually doing something about it to create the next generation of entertainment. So uh, what we want to show you first um, uh, is, you know, we got a little bit of bragging rights there that we did pick up this Emmy recently um, for one of these projects. So we thought we'd at least start with that and show you uh, what, what that award was given to us for, and then we'll pass it off to the rest of our uh, esteemed colleagues here and talk about why that this was such an important piece and where we're going to go from there. Hello, Dick Ren. The van for a murder. Get the job done or you're fired. In April 2012, Fourth Wall Studios launched its interactive comedy series, Dirty Work. Launching on Fourth Wall Studios platform Rides.tv, Dirty Work is the story of a Los Angeles crime scene cleanup crew who work the midnight to dawn shift. Oh! Each 30 minute episode is centered around Pete, Roxy, and Michelle as they tackle yet another gruesome cleaning task assigned by their overbearing boss, Dick Ren. No, no, sir. And making their job even harder is the constant appearance of Pete's annoying roommate, Hummy. This place has a foyer. It's a foyer. Potato, potato. No, it's a potato. But Dirty Work is much more than an online comedy series. Dirty Work is an immersive transmedia experience that reaches out to the audience and delivers the story across multiple mediums. Combining phone calls, texts, emails, and additional content in the form of fun facts and digital star cards, Dirty Work uses the devices audiences use every day to deliver a show that is like no other. All the elements of your life, your phone, your email account, your Twitter page, your Facebook page, what if a story was aware of all those things? Let's use all these channels that come into our lives and tell a story across all of them at once. We're bringing people entertainment value that's more personal, more dynamic, and at the end of the day, more emotional. Well, look at that. Pete's impressed. All right, enough of this bonding shit. Let's just get back to work. It all starts at rides.tv. Here, audiences can choose to log in and experience the full version of Dirty Work, or can select light mode and sit back and watch. If you choose the full experience and enter your email and phone number, the story will be delivered to you beyond the screen. You will get a text from me. Yeah, I got it. A character makes a phone call and your phone rings. The cleanup crew boss, Dickren, sends you an email. You eavesdrop on Pete's inner thoughts, letting you be part of the drama. Oh, she's almost messed up enough to date me. Tattoos, sad eyes, dead. Issues. Star cards give you extensions of a moment, a new perspective, a flashback or a flash forward, or pay off a joke set up in the episode. Hey. As the episode unfolds, the video timeline and chapter breaks reveal moments where the transmedia elements are anchored in the story, allowing you to go back and explore. Are you, uh... No, let's go. Yeah, no, do you play basketball? The Dirty Work YouTube channel, Twitter and Facebook pages give fans additional content in the form of bonus and behind the scenes videos and are a great place to comment and share with your friends. Dirty Work is produced by a creative team who come from diverse backgrounds in film, television and games. But what we all share is a passion for good storytelling and the desire to innovate. Dirty Work is the first step in Fourth Wall Studios' goal to evolve digital storytelling from linear web video to truly innovative transmedia experiences that deliver on the promise of digital entertainment. Now I'll pass it over to Steve to talk us through it. So the video showed uh, our new platform, Rides.tv, and Rides, as you saw there, is basically, first and foremost, it's a storytelling platform that uses the technology in really cool and interesting ways. And, and it's important to, to realize that 
what we're trying to do here is bake this technology into a project from the inception of the project as opposed to, oh, we're going to write a script and we're going to shoot it and we're going to then just kind of add all this extra stuff. What we try and do is work very closely with the writers and designers. They work closely together to come up with a really good reason for the technology, again, to serve the story and not the other way around. Otherwise, you, it just kind of gets gimmicky and, and stuff like that. So uh, basically, we're looking at Rides TV again. It's, it's an attempt at a native way to tell stories that the Internet wants to use the way it works the best, and that is you know, interactivity um, and, and using these different devices. And you saw in there, there also that... The interesting thing with using all these devices is we're taking advantage of, we saw the statistics earlier and your, your statistics too about how many of us are using other devices while we're watching a show and instead of delivering ancillary content, extra stuff, IMDB links and quizzes and all that stuff, we thought, well, what happens if we, if we are delivering really important and fun and compelling story content that's living in the same world that you're watching in the episode that you're watching? And... The idea behind that is we're trying to use that stuff to draw you deeper into the story as opposed to kind of distracting you out of the story, you know. So, and, and, and it's working really well. I mean, the fun part is, is you know, we're, we're looking at a case-by-case -case basis when we design these things and, again, saying what's the most effective use of this technology to kind of serve this, this story uh, that we're telling. Um, you saw there's a little bit of interactivity. Um, a lot of people, when you, when you think of interactive storytelling, you immediately think of, oh, choose your own adventure. But what we're doing is a little bit different than that in that, you know, I, I, Sean always says that, you know, hey, if Hamlet was a choose your own adventure and people chose the ending, it, would, nobody would, it wouldn't have been nowhere near as good, right? So, so what we're doing, too, is saying, look, here's the story we're telling from beginning to end. There is an interactive element in that you can lean forward and you can... You can uh, maybe uh, choose a little, you saw the star tokens come up, you can see parallel scenes or you can see, I don't, I don't want to say extra content because it's all good, especially in a comedy, it's all funny, good content that just kind of enriches and makes it even that, that much deeper. Um, so that's, and, and that can depend a little bit, each, each project there'll be maybe a little bit more, a little bit less, that's kind of my job and my department's job is to find that tightrope line of how much interactivity is just right. Um, you know, I always go back to the novel, which, you know, we all have reading, reading books. You know, what's the most that a novel asks you to do as far as interactivity goes? Well, turning the page. That's about as interactive as it gets. But the story's got to be good enough for you to want to turn the page. So that's kind of what we're, we're trying to figure out is what's the digital equivalent of, of page turning in this transmedia, you know, world that we're living in. And the other interesting thing about the platform that I really, I really like is that you know, we've all done, a lot of our backgrounds were in alternate reality games, and those of you that are familiar with that, you know, there are these giant live events that happen in real time. Well, these kind of take all the cool things that happen in alternate reality games, you know, phone calls, and, you know, imagine you're watching a show and uh, a, a character in the background texts, you know, somebody. You get that text message live in sync with what you're watching, or, or a character makes a phone call. Your phone rings and you can listen in on that conversation in sync with what's going on. So all the devices, you get emails and, and, and stuff like that. What happens uh, if we can take that and distill it into a, into a, a bite-sized chunk that you can, you can uh, consume by yourself, you can share with your friends. My goal is to do stuff that my mom can do. I don't know if we're there yet because um, <laughs> she doesn't have an iPad. Um, and, and, and also... The interesting thing too is this, because of the fact that you've got a video and you've got servers sending stuff to people, um, it really kind of, in a way, it kind of solves the piracy dilemma too because there's no way you can kind of, you know, grab this content and, and just kind of post it somewhere for somebody else to do. So it solves a lot of things uh, that, and, and really I feel like it's a really good stab uh, and a really good step forward in trying to find this native way that the, all this new digital technology wants to entertain and wants to tell stories instead of just kind of grabbing that that camera and putting it up in front of a stage. Nice. Um, so our, our, now to talk about the other side of our studio, we do technology, interactive design, but none of that's any good without really good stories to tell and really high production values. And uh, Jackie Turner is going to talk us through that.
Hi, everyone. So, yes, as I think uh, you probably gleaned from the Dirty Work uh, video, um, we are very story focused in the studio. We're all about delivering really great stories with really great characters that you care about. And one of the things I think the founders did in putting together this pretty amazing team was really looking for people who have very, a lot of experience and are really committed to making really excellent, excellent work. We also know that we can't ask audiences to leave film and television and come look at crappy, fuzzy, badly produced videos. We have to deliver them an experience that is at least as good as what they're going to get on network TV. How we do that, though, and compete with the kind of budgets and um, crew sizes and production pipelines of a television studio is the other part of our innovation. We're not just innovating in the way we deliver story, we're innovating in the way we make stuff so we can make stuff that looks really, really great, is really compelling, but at, you know, not even close to the cost of some of those TV shows. So I think we've already demonstrated that with our first few shows and we're really proud of that. But it's, you know, again, having to think outside of the box, thinking about crew sizes, roles, um, pipeline, and as Steve mentioned, also making sure that everything we make from the beginning is considered an, a 360 multiple screen um, experience. These are not tacked on, shoehorned in um, extraneous content. These are experiences that were designed from the beginning, scheduled by the AD, shot at the same time, all rights acquired, all of that stuff is done from the beginning. So that's been a very important part of how we structure what we do. And we're doing a lot. We launched Rides in April. We're about to release our ninth show and we're pr basically releasing every two weeks, which is a very ambitious and high bar set to us by our beloved CEO. Thanks for that. Benham and I have lots of grey hairs now, uh, but we are really proud and we, are, we have a really great momentum going and we'd like to share with you a couple of the projects that we have. Um, these are short trailers for our most recent projects and a sneak peek of a new one coming out next week. So the first one is Airship Dracula. This is our first animated ride. We're super excited. We've been wanting to do animation for a long time. Uh, it was created by our writer and designer, Jay Bushman, who some of you may know. And we looked for a director to kind of bring to life this steampunk uh, story that will eventually be a series. This is the pilot episode. Uh, we looked for a director who we felt would suit the sensibilities of the script and who we were very fortunate to find, Mike Roberts, who made a really great short called Rumble Seat that I'd encourage you to look at. Mike came on board and really lifted the script to a whole new dimension and we're very, very proud of this project and you can see it, of course, on rides.tv and here's a little sneak of peek of that. But I come from the peasants of the monster. A dragon who walks as man with wings of smoke and fire. Feed on living, become slave to feed. I hear the story many times, even I start to believe. But that's all it is, a story. Apparently, you can see it only on Rise TV. TV. Yeah, so uh, that's a very dark story, but uh, it's not that dark. So uh, we have we have many dark stories at Fourth Wall Studios. So uh, uh, I would encourage you to go look at that. It is so beautiful and lush. Um, I know, in the interest of time, we'll keep moving, but. Um, the next, oh, by the way, if you recognize the voice of the captain in Airship Dracula, it's because he's played by Alan Tudyk, who some of you may know from Firefly and did a fantastic job in that uh, role. One of the things that we are very, very committed to is having really excellent casting. And the next project I want to share with you has uh, stars Mark Moses from Mad Men and Jamie McShane from Sons of Anarchy. This is a story called Flair. It's a post-apocalyptic story created by our very own CEO, Jim Stewartson, and uh, directed by Dan Brown. This Flair is intended to be a world of many, many stories, and eventually what we'd love to do is actually include other people in making stories within that world, but this was the first one we did as a proof of concept and a way of kind of setting the tone and the style and the, the kind of story world that everyone will hopefully want to play in. So this is Flair. This is LXT-14, Wichita? Yeah, this is ENG D5. Well, here it comes. Exactly 7.44 a.m., 93 days in a row. Yeah, it's got to mean something.
sun comes back, what are you going to do first? Lie down in the biggest puddle and get as sunburned as I possibly can. This world will kill you in an instant. Everything comes. And our final little show and tell we want to show you is actually an exclusive because this doesn't launch actually till Monday. This is part of our Dark Wall anthology, which is our horror anthology on rides.tv. This was created by our very own executive producer, Zach Schiff Abrams, directed by Toby Wilkins, who did Grudge 2 and Splinter, um, starring Ethan Embry and Michael Ironside, and we're super excited. This is the fourth of our Dark Wall horror shorts. Yeah, so you'll see this mixed in with the rest of the Dark Wall anthology series so that you guys will get a taste of a little bit of everything. Hello again. So good to see you. I have so many wonderful things to show you. Chloe! What if she's back there? If she's back there, that means she's falling. Hello? I'm concerned about Chloe. She saw this? What's wrong? Strangers aren't welcome here. Yes, we, we, we do have some bright, sunny, uh, <laughs> easy-to-see projects coming to you very soon. So I know we need to uh, quickly wrap it up so we have time for questions, but I just wanted to point out that um, one of the things we're really excited about and one of the things we foster at Fourth Wall is collaborating and working with lots of different creatives. Uh, we have a policy that we uh, ask our entire team from the receptionists through our founders to submit ideas and you would have meant, noticed that I mentioned that a lot of these projects were created by members of the team. Uh, but we also now have a, a robust platform and we're really good at playing with other people so we've been asking people to submit their ideas and we've started partnering with other production companies, other creatives, uh, networks and high profile celebrities so this is a really uh, a great time for us to um, open up the platform and in, engage and collaborate with people like your good selves. Great. Okay. Well, I think that's all the the, uh, the talking, but we'd love to uh, talk, you know, more directly and answer questions and and have a discussion. Does anybody have any questions for us? Um, how are you sort of tracking your viewership? Yes. Um, I mean, the, the beautiful thing about being online is that we can track everything. Um, and we can, um, all of the behavior is there for us to learn from. So one of the things that we're really proud of is over the last three, four months, we've improved the, the sort of dwell time of, of people to be, now it's over 120% of the time of the ride on average. Meaning that if the ride is 10 minutes long, on average, people are staying around for 12 minutes, um, which is pretty crazy. 
Um, and, and a lot of the reason for that is because we were able to track things and create metrics that really show us what's working, what isn't working, where are things dropping off, so we can really fine tune the, the system to make the, the coolest experience we can. Do you make those statistics available at all? Um, no, only, only to that extent. You know, we're, not, uh, we're not yet in a position to kind of share the specifics. I understand. Just a question. Yeah, actually, a couple of questions. First, congratulations on the Emmy, and I just have to tell you, it's, it's great to see people who are really innovating the medium and not just kind of doing adaptations of stuff that's already out there from a formal perspective. So, um, you know, kudos on that. Thank um, you. Two questions. One, what, can you talk a little bit about your creative uh, guidelines in terms of how you consider and contemplate projects from a creative standpoint in terms of their compatibility uh, with the, the format. Um, and secondly, I'm curious, you know, how, how it works from a business perspective. Uh, well, I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, so the question was, how do we evaluate projects from a creative perspective as far as what we want to take on next? Um, first and foremost, it's good story. Uh, we, we know that all of these things live or die based on how compelling a story can be told. Um, and t kind of explaining how, how that is evaluated is, is pretty tricky. Um, it's, it's, you know, what makes a good TV show? It's, it's, it's a little bit hard to answer. Um, but if we, if we accept that sort of ambiguity <laughs> uh, for a moment, uh, the second question then becomes, how does a particular story make best use of our platform? And um, to answer that, the, the easiest trap that uh, we are guilty of and that most people who approach us are guilty of is to use these things as gimmicks. Um, if you think about, hey, there's a character on the screen, that character picks up a phone to make a phone call, and then your phone rings. That's a really cool experience. That's really fun. That's really interesting. Once, twice, by the third time, you're like, OK, I get it. I, I understand that. And, and you're in gimmick territory. Um, how much cooler is it when uh, you're watching a character who uh, is one of our examples from Dirty Work. We'll start there and then we'll go on to others. One of our examples is uh, there's this guy who's hitting on this girl. And he's being all suave and interesting and you know he's, he's playing it cool. Um, but all of a sudden your phone rings and you get to hear what he's thinking in his head as he's hitting on this girl. And he's flipping out. Oh my God, what does she think? Does she think I'm cool? Does she not think I'm cool? Did she just trip? Did I cough? You know, on and on it goes. Um, and it's this really interesting personal experience because you're literally listening to that pressed up against your head. And when you start to experiment with a tool like that, not as a phone, but as a secondary audio channel, suddenly a whole new world of opportunity opens up. That gets multiplied by 10 once you start to explore the video capabilities of that phone. What happens when you're watching a TV show and a character walks off of that screen and onto this one and then back again? Um, suddenly you've got personal experiences, suddenly you've got enhanced storytelling, and frankly, suddenly you've got a tool set that has previously been unavailable to the world for creative storytelling purposes. So we look at every story's ability to use the transmedia in a new and interesting way um, so that we step away from gimmick and into new creative tools that make it feel like oh, we've arrived at the future. Can you share something with us that maybe didn't work, something that in that vein you thought might work, but once you jumped into it, it was less than happy? Okay. Yeah, please. So, so one of the things we have we can say with great confidence is that we've screwed this up more than anybody on the planet. <laughs> and, and a lot of that um, experience leads to a bunch of rules that we've figured out along the way, partly by screwing them up. So for example, you have a great action sequence and everything is exciting and suddenly the show wants to send you an email. No, no, not a good, not a good experience. Nobody wants to pause it and go open Outlook or whatever and then read an email and then come back. So what we figured out was emails are actually really great carriers of information for a big message, for one that has content, for one that's going to reward uh, the, the viewer for making that effort. And so at the beginning or end of a chapter is the perfect place for it. Similarly, like uh, text messages are 
if you think about these things as musical compositions, they're like trumpet blares, right? They're, they're very quick, they're short, they emphasize, and then they go away very quickly. And that's the way that we use text messages um, all the time. So it's really, it's, it's really a whole set of rules and heuristics that have been developed, you know, again, by just blowing it numerous times um, that, that helps us figure those things out. Thanks. Another question, sir? That, that's a great question. We one of the one of the things that we've learned over the years is that there is a very bright line for an audience member between being somebody who's being told a story and somebody who's in the story. As soon as you ask somebody to play a character in the story, you've asked them to make a commitment that a lot of people just aren't willing to make. It feels scary and weird and role-playing and nerdy and so what we've been focusing on are experiences that are very mainstream and for the most part that means experiences where you're the viewer there's a big old curtain in between and the story is over here so we're surrounding you with the story but we're not asking you to play a role in it so generally. we're dabbling in that though we're, yeah. we're, 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 we're stepping we're moving that fourth wall a little back and forth sometimes. We're, we're, so again, it's that line, it's that balance, how much interactivity, how much asking you to be a part of the story is too much. It's more that you're like that. stepping into the character's shoes for a moment when you hear his inner thoughts almost and out again. For the, for the people listening at home, the, the question was, uh, how, where's the line? How much are characters passive versus involved in the story? And, and I, I would also, on top of all these really great answers to that, I, I want to add from a game design point of view, what, what became really interesting when you, when you are a character in a story, in any kind of story, suddenly you have to deal with a very unexpected problem, which is player failure. How do you deal with a player who's just not going to cooperate, who does something you didn't think of? It's not really fun to fail at the movies. It's not really fun to fail at TV. Um, and so we had to, in dealing with that very particular problem that emerges when suddenly a player is not a passive audience member, but an active participant in the story, um, it started to break in so many ways. Um, we have a product up online on rides.tv right now uh, called The Gamblers. And you'll start to see our first attempts to dealing with the player failure issue um, and how to involve them. Uh, so the question was, are, are there any success examples of players becoming characters? Um, there are, uh, I mean, what you're basically describing is the entirety of the video game industry. <laughs> um, so uh, yes, there are some very, very successful examples. Um, when we look at the scale between video games over here, very, very active, and movies on this side, excuse me, um, very, very passive, we really are, want to explore the space in the middle where we believe there's a massive untapped audience. Sir. Oh, just as a follow-up to that, uh, uh, to bridge the difference along, you come from a background in game design. Um, can you talk about, uh, while not necessarily making the uh, consumer be a player as part of the story, uh, can you talk about maybe applying traditional game mechanics or how you would apply the traditional game me mechanics to keep the consumers more engaged across multiple screens? Uh, sure. So the question was, how do we apply traditional game mechanics mechanics to keep consumers more engaged with the story. Um, th the really easy answer, like the secret to all of game design applied here as well, is make your player feel like an absolute badass all the time. Um, and, and it really is, I mean, there's no simple answer, but the problem really is that simple. And so when we look at um, the, the platform on which we're telling our stories, a big screen and smaller screens and uh, technology devices, the answer for us always is, hey, when your phone rings, you know exactly what to do. You don't need to read a manual. You don't need a tutorial. You know exactly what to do when your phone rings. How do we make you feel like a rock star for answering your phone? How do we make you feel like a rock star for advancing from one chapter to the next? How do we make you feel like a rock star for getting to the end of a story? And that really is where the secret to engaging an audience uh, and keeping an audience and getting that audience to tell all their friends about the experience, that's really where the secret sauce is. Who's going to be the next badass question? 
Go. <laughs> no pressure. I think the the uh, the repeating question. Oh, the question is: Is serial or episodic um, content working better in this format? Um, the wishy-washy answer, and I, I think it's the true answer, however, is that it's like video, right? Sometimes it works episodically. Sometimes it works serially. Um, sometimes things work things work as one-offs. Sometimes longer, shorter. It really, the cool thing about it is that we found out that it really just depends on the story that you're telling. It depends on, you know, it's all about the characters that are in it. And the, the, the nice thing is that the, the way we're doing it is flexible enough to kind of take all of those things into account. Um, for the most part, we are we're creating episodic content um, just because it's, it, from kind of a business point of view, it's a better model. Um, but it, there's really no, you know, Restriction. It's also worth saying that in the case of dirty work, um, we've had an overwhelming response for more episodes. So there, there seems to be a huge audience for episodic content in that regard. Yeah, we did three episodes, um, and whenever users got to the end of the third, they basically write us an email at that <laughs> point saying, "Where's the next one?" So we have. So we're working on that. We have time for one more question, and you've had your hand up. Uh, the, the, well, the answer is yes to, to, to that. Um, the, the question is for everyone online is, how are we making money? Um, right now, we're focusing on the platform. We're focusing on audience acquisition. But the, the business model is exactly the same as it is for video. That is, we own the IP. Uh, we are exploiting it on other platforms, television, uh, Etc. And um, sponsorship um, is is absolutely um, happening. So the, the, that's the the short answer. Thank you so much. Um, we need people like this out there forging the way and you know raising the flag and taking arrows. So please give these guys a big hand. <laughs> Thank you.